All right. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for attending this virtual meeting. Uh, we are, I would like to call to order the Tuesday, May 19th, uh, Regional Transportation Committee meeting. Uh, with that, uh, we are we are virtual, as everybody knows. Um, hopefully, everybody has been through these. Um, I will skip the um, go to web webinar uh, tutorial. Uh, I will try and prompt you when uh, when we need hands raised so we can get input. And um, with that, I would uh, like to uh, go to the next item: public comment. Uh, is there anybody for public comment? If there is. Uh, please uh, raise your virtual hand and we will identify you. So, Melinda, um, why don't we give it a few seconds here and uh, please let me know if there is public comment. Uh, it looks like we already do have a hand raise. Uh, it looks like we have two. So, uh, I'll start with the person who raised their hand first. It looks like it is Maureen McKenna. So, Maureen, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. You have three minutes to make your public comment. Once you've hit three minutes, I will notify you so you can make your uh, your closing statement. Thank you, Melinda. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Um, hi, everyone. This is Maureen McCann. I'm the Education and Safety Director with Bicycle Colorado, also representing the Denver Streets, Har Streets Partnership today. Uh, we were thrilled to see Dr. Cog stepping up as a regional leader by taking on a Vision Zero Action Plan and grateful to be involved as stakeholders in the process. We applaud the project team for their hard work and are excited to be so close to the finish line of an adopted plan. However, as written, there is no explicit goal of zero fatalities stated in the plan. This seems to have led to significant confusion among stakeholders and member governments about what the region is striving toward. Today, we present a moral argument for a stronger commitment to the fundamental premise of Vision Zero as well as to uphold Dr. Cog's various messaging efforts and your responsibility as an agency. In our initial review of the plan, we assumed along with others that zero was Dr. Cog's goal. And why would we have had reason to assume otherwise when discussing, when discussing Vision Zero? Dr. Cog's outreach and marketing efforts have also suggested this, including a video that ends firmly with our regional vision is zero. However, it was later brought to our attention that Dr. Cog's Metro Vision 2040 has a conflicting goal of fewer than 100 fatalities. Without stating a goal of zero in the Vision Zero plan, we are led to believe that fewer than 100 is the current goal. The discussion during TAC also seems to suggest this, and the goal would not, uh, and that the goal would not be revised until Metro Vision updates next year. This default goal for a Vision Zero action plan is unacceptable. The plan should leave no confusion around what we are trying to achieve and set an explicit traffic safety performance measure of zero fatalities by a specific date. If there's any hesitation around setting a new goal in this plan, we'd like to reinforce some points. We realize there are concerns around inconsistencies between Dr. Cog's two plans, but this allows a procedural argument to override an ethical one. Now is the time for Dr. Cog to demonstrate itself as a bold leader, its commitment to human life, and to set the tone for the entire region. Now as much as ever, we need ambition and urgency. That is what it will take to ensure no one loses their life due to preventable traffic violence in our region. Additionally, the plan cannot accurately be described as Vision Zero or People First, as it currently is, without a clear commitment to eliminating traffic deaths of all who live in Denver, the Denver region, including lower income and communities of color who are disproportionately impacted by traffic violence. The fact that Dr. Cog has identified itself as behind schedule in its traffic safety performance measures is even more reason to establish a commitment to zero. This plan provides meaningful tools and evidence-based countermeasures to support local governments in advancing your collective goal. But without an explicit goal of zero, any efforts to improve traffic safety are severely undermined. If Dr. Cog decides not to explicitly identify zero in the Vision Zero plan, we ask that you include the Metro Vision goal of fewer than 100 deaths for transparency, so as not to require cross-checking multiple plans and to avoid assumptions like our own. We'd like to point out that any discomfort with this proposal is a suggestion that Dr. Cog is using the wrong goal. Maureen, like, you have your three minutes. Please make your closing statement. Thank you. We would then expect the region's goal to be revised during uh, Metro Vision 2050, and we'd like to be informed on when that discussion will take place. Thanks, everyone, for the time today. We look forward to the discussion. Uh, on behalf of Bicycle Colorado and the Denver Streets Partnership and our supporters, we're working hard to ensure a day when we reach Vision uh, Zero Traffic Fatalities. We appreciate your collaboration on this. Thank you, Thank Maureen. You. Go ahead, Mr. Chair. No, uh, Melinda, is is there a, a second uh, person for public comment, please? 
There is. It looks like um, our next public comment is from Michelle Roach. Uh, Michelle, you'll have three minutes, and then uh, I will let you know when your three minutes is up to make your closing statement. Thank you, Melinda. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you said, my name is Michelle Roach, and I've lived in Denver for 30 years in District 6. And I'm speaking to address Dr. Cog's taking action on Regional Vision Zero Plan as well, specifically the stated goal of also achieving fewer than 100 deaths per year as a success story. What I'd like to share today is the story about my son, Cole Sukel. Um, in 2016, at the age of 14, Cole was killed a block from home um, while standing in a bike lane trying to cross Yale Boulevard. Cole was on his way to his nearby middle school playground when, he, when a speeding elderly and drunk driver hit him at high speed. And as you might imagine, it's been a really devastated loss. I'm sure you can hear the emotion in my voice. In 2017, just a few months after Cole died, the city of Denver announced they would be adopting Vision Zero. And they asked my family if we'd be willing to share Cole's story to underscore the importance of it, to give perspective to what Vision Zero really means, and we agreed. At that time, we knew very little about things like street design. We just trusted our city government to make our city safe. And that's why I'm here speaking with you. I pay a lot more attention now, and I still trust my city government to do what's right, not just what's easy. People have the basic human right to walk and move around their neighborhoods without fear that they will be killed. And city governments have the moral responsibility to make human safety the number one priority. Yet way too many people are killed every single year because of traffic violence. Hundreds are killed every year in Colorado and thousands more seriously hurt. And the most outrageous part is that it's preventable. We have it well within our means to implement practical low-tech infrastructure like bike lanes, medians, sidewalks, better time traffic lights, and lower speed limits. And to adopt policies that make distracted and impaired driving unconscionable and to ensure it with laws that show we mean it. I agreed to sharing Cole's story in Denver's Vision Zero announcement because I believed and trusted that the people in your positions meant you were taking zero seriously, that you wanna stop traffic violence, not just slow it down. Any success metric more than zero to me is a disgrace and it would show a complete lack of real leadership. Who are the hundred people you'd be willing to call to, to sacrifice and call good? Please think about that for a second. Would it be your child, your parent, the people you love most? Surely we can all recognize that any life lost is a failure. And I implore you to put the resources, both financial and human, behind making our basic human safety your most urgent priority, because without it, nothing else really matters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... Ms. Roach, I, I appreciate your testimony and my condolences. Uh, Melinda, uh, is there anybody else for public comment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. There are no other hands raised. Great. Um, seeing none, we will close public comment at 8.41 a.m. Uh, the, next, uh, the next item is our consent agenda. Uh, this is something rather new. Um, we are trying to expedite and, stream, and streamline the virtual um, regional transportation committee meeting by adding a consent agenda. We believe the items uh, we have placed uh, there on the agenda are non-controversial and all had a unanimous recommendation from TAC. Uh, just like board meetings, any member of the RTC can request to remove an item from the consent agenda and it will be taken up um, as an action item as a part of this agenda. So with that, um, is there any, um, any item that any member would like to uh, pull for uh, for further discussion, or I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Melinda, motion to approve the consent agenda. I'm sorry. I move we approve the consent agenda. Thank you very much, uh, Director Stoltzman. Do I have a second? Second. Second. I have a second. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, against. Abstain. Uh, 
consent agenda motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, the next part of our agenda is the action items. Uh, item four, discussion of the Dr. Cog Regional Multimodal Freight Plan Adoption. Mr. Helfman. Is is Evan on the line? I just want to see if 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 he is or not. He's not. Yeah, I don't see him. He's not. Okay. Okay. Well, then I will take it. Thank you. Um, Matthew Helfand, Senior Transportation Planner, Dr. Cog. Good morning. Um, move on to the, well, before we move on to the next slide, um, the, 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 current, uh, the current plan was last updated in 2016 as part of the 2040 MVRTP. And it, it wasn't anywhere near as, um, as comprehensive as the uh, as the plan that we bring before you today, and uh, we did um, sig significant stakeholder and public engagement uh, throughout the course of development of this plan, and um, uh, many of the local governments that um, that are that are members of Dr. Cog, as well as other stakeholders uh, from private industry, uh, helped us develop this plan. And so uh, I'll I'll bring up the next slide. I'll I'll brief you on it, and we are looking for um, uh, approval to adopt today. So some of the the goals and outcomes: uh, engaging industry. As I said, we worked with stakeholders and local government partners. Uh, we had. Uh, uh, freight workshops where we, we delved deep into uh, the, the, the priorities uh, for freight and goods movement in the Denver region. And then we also had a, a stakeholder group that was made up of uh, local governments and private industry uh, that helped us throughout to, to develop this plan. Uh, we, uh, we, we documented trends and conditions. Uh, provided some baseline information, data, and best practices. And the best part was we were able to get the data uh, from CDOT's recently adopted statewide uh, multimodal freight plan uh, in order to, uh, uh, to, to get the, the, the best uh, uh, data for the Denver region. Uh, we also uh, developed an inventory of current needs uh, and um, a, a vision regional freight priority network uh, that um, illustrates a future freight focus areas. And uh, at the end, we also include uh, strategies and actions and um, for coordination. And uh, really this, this plan should be seen as a regional blueprint. Uh, we are encouraging others uh, at, at the more local level in the Denver region to um, to do their own plans and, and continue the study. So next slide. So as I said, uh, we had stakeholder and partner engagement. Uh, there is a snapshot of, of uh, what we conducted. We had, uh, as I said, a couple forums and several uh, stakeholder meetings with a committee that we put together. Next slide. So uh, that, that advisory committee gave us some guidance. Uh, they they uh, told us what they wanted this plan to address um, and achieve. And, and you can see all of those items on the slide. Next slide. So uh, the contents and a, a basic summary of, of the plan. Uh, so uh, preparing the uh, multimodal freight plan had an inter integration with regional plans, uh, industry and, and planning partner involvement, stakeholder and public input, uh, connecting the economy. We had some great data there uh, discussing uh, how important freight and goods movement is to the economy and the Denver region, uh, delivering the region. Uh, uh, we talked about uh, multimodal conditions, uh, planning for the future. Uh, we have some forecasts, some emerging industry trends, uh, focusing on freight, uh, and uh, coordinating investments, uh, which uh, is is part of that that blueprint to set us up uh, to to make decisions on um, on projects in the future. Next slide. So for uh, preparing the plan, uh, we we included safety, uh, connectivity, 
uh, sustainability, technology, delivery, and coordination uh, as our uh, priorities. Next slide. And so um, here, uh, it's it, it's it's really incredible to think of what an imp what impact uh, freight and goods movement has on the Denver region. As you can see, that that's uh, a heck of a lot of jobs uh, and in various industries, uh, not to mention the, the the commodities by value and and, and tonnage. Uh, it, it's a it's a real significant impact in the Denver region. Next slide. And so we developed a regional highway freight vision network. Um, tier one is just the uh, the National Highway Freight Network, uh, which is the, the federally designated National Highway Freight System or network. Um, and then we added uh, the, the National Highway System that, and then we identified intermodal and local connectors. Uh, so basically, the, this shows um, the, the, the key corridors in the Denver region for freight and goods movement. Next slide. So planning for the future, uh, we, we were able to gather some best practices uh, from around the country um, and around the region. Uh, one of the, the, the great um, uh, freight plans that we found was from our own region. Uh, it, it was funded by Dr. Cog and um, it was developed by um, some of our local planning partners. So uh, it was great to show that as well. Next slide. Uh, so focusing on freight, we, we have some key regional strategies, uh, uh, a comprehensive regional goods movement plan, uh, encouraging local area, uh, local area corridor and site specific plans as i said uh, that this is a uh, a blueprint and and we want to encourage uh, some uh, more in-depth study um, uh, considering uh, uh, goods movement issues um, uh, uh, developing coordinated and comprehensive uh, freight land use plans and policies preserving freight uh, infrastructure and assets for for future uses, so that's why we we identified uh, some of those uh, key corridors. Um, uh, compiling freight-specific regional data, as I said, we were able to uh, get that from the uh, CDOT plan. As we used, um, we worked with Cambridge Systematics, who developed the statewide uh, multimodal freight plan, and they were able to get the the same data uh, from the state plan and take a deeper dive to the, the Denver region. And then we, we target investments and pursue grant opportunities by uh, setting up, uh, setting up uh, a situation where we've, we've started to study and identify uh, what, what our needs are. So next slide. So uh, we identified several uh, regional freight focus areas. Um, these are encouraged for additional study as their key uh, areas in, in the region for freight and goods movement. Next slide. And so uh, in summary, um, the, the plan is a, a strategic regional framework. Uh, it, it really is meant to set up future coordination, planning and action uh, by our stakeholders, both in, um, in government, local government, as well as private industry. Uh, we worked really well together uh, to, to develop this plan and encourage our stakeholders to continue uh, to delve deeper. Um, we, we have uh, uh, plenty uh, of key information, uh, local studies, uh, uh, case studies from around the country uh, to help our local planning partners uh, develop their own studies and projects. And um, uh, uh, considering uh, freight in all plans um, is, is a key takeaway uh, as freight uh, is a component in, in almost any transportation project. You have to think about um, 
what its impact will be on freight and goods movement. Uh, once again, uh, we uh, the uh, partnerships, coordination, uh, and information were, were key uh, to this endeavor as uh, this was the first time that we worked with uh, stakeholders at this significant of a level to develop the plan. And we intend to continue to build on those relationships and uh, work to, to help uh, improve uh, freight and goods movement in the region. Um, but this is, like I said, uh, still emerging and uh, developing and uh, we will continue to dive deeper uh, into freight and goods movement. Next slide. I believe that that that's the presentation of the, the, the recommended motions there, and I'd be happy to take any questions, pointing out that uh, there may be some technical questions that uh, our, our consultant uh, couldn't make it today uh, that I might be able, I might have to get back to you after um, getting the answers from our consultant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Helfant. Uh, <clears throat> committee members, are there any questions at this time? If there are, please raise your virtual hand and Ms. Stevens will call on you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our first question is from uh, Jeff Coleman. Jeff, uh, if you'd like to go ahead and make your question or comment. Yeah, thank you. Good, good presentation, Matthew. Very interesting subject. So one area um, within the region that I didn't see a lot of emphasis on which is pretty problematic, maybe not as much to the Denver region itself, but to the, it's the I-70 mountain corridor. And of course, Dr. Cog goes all the way up to the Eisenhower Tunnel. Does this mm -hmm. plan get into some prescriptive ideas on how to deal with that corridor? Things like truck parking um, during inclement weather, things like that. Uh, there, There is, if I remember correctly, we, we we do go into truck parking a little bit in the plan, uh, but also um, in CDOT's plan, uh, there is significant emphasis on truck parking, especially on corridors like I-70. And um, CDOT actually had a workshop that I attended on truck parking. It was an all day truck parking workshop. I wanna say it was several months ago now. Uh, there's definitely an, an emphasis uh, from from you know our key planning partner CDOT on this, and so um, we work together with CDOT. We share the consultant, um, so there's definitely there's definitely an emphasis on on those issues. Yeah, I just didn't see it through your presentation, and I know it's a a critical issue, um, particularly during the winter months. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Stevens, anybody else uh, for questions? Uh, yes, it looks like we do have another hand raise uh, from Paul Gisaitis. Paul, let me go ahead and unmute you. All right, you should be able to speak. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I just wanted to echo uh, Jeff's uh, comments about truck parking in Region 1. Um, even though we do have truck stops and we have uh, limited truck parking in the I-70 West Corridor, he is totally correct that um, uh, truck parking is very important from us. We hear from the industry all the time that there's not enough safe truck parking. And um, and they've even talked about some innovative things like uh, uh, having the ability for trucks to reserve a space um, at a truck parking um, location that is safe and clean um, while they're still in another state so that when they're uh, ready to get to Colorado, they have a, a space reserved for them. Um, there are uh, regulatory problems with doing something like that, some federal laws and some things like that, but I, I would still echo that um, that is the kind of thing we should really look at in the future on how we can uh, pay for these kind of amenities that um, not only help with uh, operations on Interstate 70, I-25, but um, also help with safety dramatically. So uh, thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Gisaitis. Um, Ms. Stevens, anybody else? For questions. Um, I'll give everyone just another second and it looks like we do not have any other hands raised. Great, uh, seeing that I am uh, I'm open to entertain a motion. Please raise your hand. Okay, looks like uh, our first hand came from Joan Peck. Joan, I will go ahead and unmute you so you can make the motion. 
Thank you. Uh, I move to recommend to the Board of Directors adoption of the Dr. Cog Regional Multimodal Freight Plan. Thank you, Director Peck. Uh, do we have a second? We do from Jeff Coleman. Jeff, go ahead. I second the motion. Great. Thank you, Committee Member Coleman. Um, uh, Ms. Stevens, can we open the mics so we can take a, uh, a vote? Yep, the mics are open. Great. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Abstain? The motion carries. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, the next item is a discussion for taking action on the regional Vision Zero adoption. Um, Beth, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm Beth Salvo. I'm with Dr. Cog's staff, and we'll pre be presenting on the draft of taking action on Region Vision Zero. Um, which we are anticipating to take to the Dr. Cog Board of Directors for adoption tomorrow night. Um, I'm hoping a lot of people are familiar with this concept now, um, but just as a reminder, Vision Zero is a transportation safety philosophy based on the principle that loss of life is not an acceptable price to pay for mobility. Um, I think it's fairly obvious as to why the Denver region needs an initiative like this. Um, in 2017, 266 people were killed in the Denver region streets and highways. Um, that's a 50% increase region-wide since 2013. Um, if you look at the percent of all crashes by travel mode versus the percent of fatal crashes by travel mode, you will see that the large percent of fatal crashes involve people walking, biking, um, on motorcycles, showing, um, showing that we need to make a point to focus on these vulnerable users as we begin to implement initiatives. Um, this is a map that we included in the plan that illustrates KSI crashes from years 2013 to 2017, which is the five years of data we use for analysis included in this plan. Um, 1,149 people died, 8,827 people were seriously injured just in this short um, five years time frame. Um, that's almost 10,000 people in the region that were affected by these types of crashes. So there was extensive conversation um, at TAC about Dr. Cox, what Dr. Cog's target is and what it should be. Um, we do want to iterate that Dr. Cog is committed to a goal of zero. Every life matters, no fatality is acceptable. Um, I wanted to thank Michelle for sharing her story about her cool son. It really puts the seriousness and importance of this initiative in perspective. Um, so again, our target is zero. Um, this plan's adoption is ahead of schedule of two other plans that are involved in the target setting process. Um, these two other plans involved are MetroVision, which is Dr. Cog's comprehensive plan that includes our overarching themes, outcomes, um, performance measures. Um, this slide shows the current 2040 targets that were established. Um, this is where um, the target of fewer than 100 fatalities annually lives. Please keep in mind that this target was set well before Vision Zero. Um, was in effect. Um, we also have the 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, as you know, Dr. Clark's staff is currently working on the 2050 MVRTP. Um, as part of the 2050 MVRTP, we're going to be updating and reassessing these 2040 targets to 2050 targets, and this is when we're going to include the target of zero. Um, these targets must be approved by the Dr. Cog board, and once it is, we are planning on amending taking action on regional vision zero to include these new updated um, safety targets. So again, Dr. Cog is committed to zero and it will be included in future plans. Um, there was extensive public outreach done for this plan. We kicked off the project with the regional Vision Zero video, a short survey and an interactive map that allowed the public to select locations with safety issues throughout the region. We um, received 3,300 survey responses and over 1,000 interactive map comments. Um, this map is also included in the plan and it shows how the interactive map locations overlap with the data-driven regional hydro network and as you can see um, this map um, shows that the data-driven areas are pretty consistent with locations the public identified um, the 30-day public comment period started march 19th and closed april 18th um, dr cog received over 100 comments from stakeholders and the public um, those comments are included in the agenda packet with our responses um, I did want to thank everyone who took the time to review the plan and submit comments. Um, we responded to the comments and included suggested um, changes in the plan where appropriate. So the Regional Vision Toolkit is the bulk of the plan. It consists of the data-driven regional high injury network, crash profiles broken up into by area type, uh, behavioral profiles, and countermeasures. 
Um, the Hindry network was developed by identifying road segments with the highest KSI crash density, KSI meaning killed and serious injuries. Um, again, we use KSI crashes from 2013 through 2017. Um, since the regional network did end up being so large, we decided to do a more detailed analysis and, and identify critical corridors along the regional Hindry network. Um, to identify these corridors, each of the 10 counties within doc the Dr. Cog boundary were analyzed separately to ensure um, the critical corridors were dispersed regionally. Um, once we identified where these crashes were happening, we wanted to dissect those crashes more and figure out what's actually happening within those crashes, figure out some of the mechanics, the behaviors involved, and start moving towards certain countermeasures that will begin to reduce these crashes. Um, on a regional scale, we know the region is very diverse from a land use perspective. Um, Crashes in rural areas are different than what's happening in urban areas of downtown Denver. Um, so one of the first things we did was develop a four different area types, urban, um, suburban, compact communities, rural, and limited access highways. And we did that using a variety of data sources to reflect the different build environments throughout the region. We identified three things within each area type, first being the crash profiles, which look into specific events and types of crashes that are occurring these are what inform the infrastructure countermeasures that are included in the plan. Um, second, uh, behavior profiles, which are the human behaviors that may have led to a crash. Um, and then lastly, we wanted to identify countermeasures, uh, which are strategies that are recognized as best practices, practices for addressing and reducing the identified crash types. Sorry about that, it's lagging a little. There we go. Um, this portion of the plan um, identifies objectives and action initiatives that, that we as a region need to work towards. Um, there's six main objectives. Um, this objective, um, this is an example of objective one, um, improved collaboration between allied agencies. Um, this objective has two main action initiatives. Those action initiatives have sub-actions to better identify tasks within the action initiatives. It identifies who will be responsible, who will take the lead on the actions, and identifies what years the action will begin. Um, this is pretty much so how all the objectives are set up. There are 25 different action initiatives identified within the plan. And um, there are also performance metrics that are identified for each action initiative that Dr. Cog will be tracking annually to determine um, what progress we're making as this plan begins to be implemented. Um, it also includes some suggestions on how um, local jurisdictions can stay involved in the upcoming years, such as participating in the Regional Vision Zero work group, participating in training opportunities, collecting data, applying for grants, um, joining the Regional Vision Zero Network, which is just a good source of safety information. Um, I want to reiterate that this is the only, only the start of the plan. Um, Dr. Cog is currently working alongside CDOT to release a urban arterials multimodal safety improvements call projects that will specifically focus on safety projects along the regional high injury network and critical corridors. Um, we're working with FHWA to host a pedestrian safety workshop May 27th and 28th. Uh, we currently have an RFP out for our complete streets toolkit that will just build on the countermeasures and list more detailed countermeasures that are listed in this plan. Um, I'm working on Action Initiative 1.1, which is organizing the Regional Vision Zero work group. Um, that, the first meeting for that will be sometime next month. Um, I'm also working with our engagement specialist to, engage, to establish a regional Vision Zero engagement plan um, that will develop more um, as we get the working group started and we get those meetings going. Um, with that, uh, Dr. Cog's staff is asking you to move to recommend to the Dr. Cog Board of Directors the adoption of taking action on regional Vision Zero. Um, and I'm also happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delaboa. Um, committee members, if you have questions uh, for the presenter or additional discussion on this item, please raise, uh, raise your virtual hand and uh, Ms. Stevens will call on you. And uh, with that, Ms. Stevens. Um, Mr. Please. Chair. Yes, Mr. Sir. Yes, sir. Ron, I, I apologize for the quick interruption. I, I did want to correct one thing. The, the proposed motion that came from the Transportation Advisory Committee that we're presenting um, to the committee today, I apologize, is not the correct recommended motion in the presentation. The correct recommended motion language is in the staff report language um, in attachment F. And it just adds the recommendation that came from 
that came from TAC um, with the specific caveat that staff revisit the issue of a specific target date in the as part of the 2050 RTP process. And the, the point is, as, as Beth had stated in the presentation, that our goal is definitely zero with the adoption of this Vision Zero plan for the region. Um, but there are just a couple of plan revision steps through the RTP and Metro Vision to um, uh, revise the um, existing target that exists in Metro Vision. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Mr. Pastor. Um, I, um, I appreciate the uh, clarification. Um, Ms. Stevens, um, is there anybody who are raising their hand for a for questions or additional discussion. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it looks like the first hand that went up was from Rebecca White. So Rebecca, let me unmute you and you're good to go. All right, thanks everyone. Rebecca White with CDOT. I uh, don't have a question as, as much as a comment and a relevant update for the committee. Um, you know, CDOT, we're very happy to be able to partner with Dr. Cog um, on this initiative. Um, you know, every time I see these uh, data points, it just brings home the seriousness of this issue. Um, so to that end, I did want to provide an update on the, the CDOT side of a topic we discussed last month, which is the launch of this urban arterial safety program that Beth mentioned. Um, we are, are moving forward a recommendation to the Transportation Commission this week that we provide uh, $17 million in available funding to that initiative immediately. And we are also going through the rest of our, our budget cuts and, and how we sort of absorb the economic impact we're seeing, but still I be able to um, free up um, some additional Senate Bill 267 funds for this. So I think we feel pretty confident on our end we'll be able to, to move forward with launching this program together with Dr. Cog very shortly. And I'm certainly excited to to see what ideas we get from the local governments and get some good improvements out there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Melinda, uh, is there anybody else with their hand raised? Uh, yes, we do have one additional question um, from the public, if you would like to entertain it. Um, yeah, I think it's abnormal, but sure. Yeah, let's um, let's entertain that uh, question or comment. All right, thank you. Uh, then our next question is from Maureen McKenna. Maureen, you are unmuted and you may speak. Thank you, Melinda, and thank you, um, Chair. I think going back to my uh, comments on behalf of Bicycle Color and the Denver Streets Partnership, um, I we wanted to again bring attention to the fact that without a specific goal and commitment within this plan. Um, it, it's it's really hard for for us to settle with um, with your your commitment here to address this um, goal and the metric further down the road. So we just ask you to um, clarify where in in the plan can viewers can local governments see that the region's uh, goal is zero. Um, I think it mentions the goal of zero multiple times in the plan. We just don't have a year tied to it yet. I think, and that's um, that performance metric is is very important to us, and and we um, just want to advocate again that that is clearly stated in the plan, and that's something that we overlooked, and and it, it appears to us at this point that the goal is still uh, the fewer than a hundred stated in the metro in the metro vision. All right. Um, thank you for your uh, for your comments, uh, Melinda. Is is there anybody else with their their hand raised? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our next question is from Ashley Stolzman. Ashley, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ms. Stevens. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, as as one director, I am more than comfortable with having a year in the plan. If other folks would like to do that. Um, Boulder County has adopted um, 2035 as our target year, and it's in the um, Boulder um, County plan um, for Vision Zero to have 2035 as the year that we're targeting to have zero deaths. Uh, I understand there may be some um, challenge with getting everyone in the region to agree to that, but I just wanted to say that we would become, I would be comfortable and other folks in my, my neck of the woods would be comfortable with a date. Um, I did have a question for Director Papsdorf. Um, 
are there things that we could do in the short term to really get going on this so that we could really show our commitment in the short term to Vision Zero? Um, thank you for the question, Director Stolzman. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I might. Um, I appreciate the question and, it, and it, again, I want to reiterate the fact that um, with the adoption of taking action on uh, regional Vision Zero, our goal is zero fatalities on the transportation system in this region. Um, there's a difference between a goal and an interim target that we're aiming for to try to make progress towards that goal. Um, and we will revisit that specific MetroVision target um, in within the context of all of our MetroVision performance targets and the regional transportation plan. But to directly answer your question, there are a number of strategies directly included within the regional Vision Zero plan um, that is before you and actions that we're already starting to take. And Beth, Beth mentioned a few of those, but I'll, I'll restate a few. So uh, an important first step is um, our partnership with CDOT to actually invest real dollars in um, safety focused um, improvements on the region's transportation system. Uh, we look forward to investing significant resources in the near term through that process, working with our local government partners on selecting the best projects. But uh, we will we will have in the range of 50 to 77 million dollars to invest in safety related transportation improvements um, on the system over the next couple of years as part of that uh, cooperative effort. So we're really excited about that. Uh, real concrete step. Um, secondly, uh, we are um, in the process of, of selecting a consultant to prepare um, a regional um, complete streets toolkit that will be made available to all of our um, regional local government partners that actually speaks to how to design streets to be safer and safely accommodate all modes of transportation um, on those facilities. So that's a, that's a step that we're taking uh, forward that really is tied directly back to this regional vision zero plan and there are there are multiple specific strategies laid out uh, for all of the partners in the region to pursue to address um, the safety problems that we've identified through this planning process great uh thank you director papsdorf um linda are, are there any additional uh, hands raised uh, yes, we do have another hand raise. It looks like it is from Don Stanton. Don, you are unmuted. Uh, you'll just need to self unmute. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of the 11 transportation commissioners for CDOT, I uh, wanted to just give you an update on the new state transportation safety plan. Uh, transportation commission is charged with ensuring that safety is included in all the major projects. So what we're doing uh, as we go through this extensive review is we're working closely with our partners at FHWA. Um, we also, in the state highway uh, or transportation safety plan, are working with uh, CSP and others. And also just want to second what Rebecca White mentioned in planning, uh, even with money as tight as it is, we're trying to uh, keep money in these key projects, such as urban arterials, which will help safety on some of the key uh, arteries such as federal, et cetera. And we're working closely with Paul Josidis and the engineers uh, to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Melinda, any, any additional hands raised? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, it looks like um, we do have another hand raised. I believe this is uh, Angie Riviera Malpietti. I will go ahead and unmute you. You're good to go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Melinda. Um, you know, I am a, a Transportation Management Association director working primarily in disadvantaged communities that are multilingual. And uh, I have to say that Vision Zero in a zero, um, a zero number of fatalities is absolutely what we need to be focused on. But the other thing that I'd like to share with you is as we're doing community outreach on all of these different components, there are a lot of folks out there who are transit dependent and are walking and biking who do not speak English as their first language, nor do they have access to be able to fill out a survey online. And so I would just uh, ask that we look at alternative methodologies of receiving 
input from different um, community members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just to add, just to add to that, when we when we put our survey out for Regional Vision Zero, we d we did have it in English and Spanish, so we did we did get some perspectives from those groups of people. Thank you very much, um, Melinda. Any additional questions or comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. At this time, I see no additional hands raised. Great. Um, so with that, I I, I just want to share with the. Uh, the rest of the committee, um, this, this topic was a discussion uh, within the executive committee at our last executive committee meeting. Um, everyone indicated uh, they were very open to discuss uh, with staff uh, this issue and how to integrate uh, Vision Zero into our Metro Vision Plan. Uh, they, were, they were encouraged um, and quite honestly excited to, uh, to, to have further discussions. Um, so, I mean, with that, um, I would I would open it up to um, to a proposed motion. Um, Melinda, is is there anybody raising their hands for a proposed motion? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not see any hands raised yet, but we'll give everyone just a moment so we can see if we can get a motion. Maybe just uh, open up the phone lines and we can. Uh, and oh, it does look like we uh, we have a motion from Wynn Shaw. Wynn, go ahead. Thanks. I would move to recommend the Board of Directors adoption of taking action on Regional Vision Zero with the caveat that staff revisit the issue of a specific target date in the 2050 process. Great. Uh, thank you, Director Shaw. And Belinda, maybe just open the phone lines now. We'll take a second and then and then we'll vote. So. Uh, let me know when the phone lines are open. Absolutely, all members are able to speak. Great, uh, I'm looking for a second, please. So moved, or I move to second. Okay, um, thank you uh, very much. Uh, we have a motion to second, all in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 Against? Aye. Abstain? All right, thank you. Motion, motion carries. Uh, we are, we'll move on to the informational briefings of our agenda. Uh, item six, proposed technical amendment to the 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, Jacob, please. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is a really quick item. We really just wanted to be transparent with you all on this. Um, as we've been discussing even this morning, we're in the midst of our 2050 regional transportation plan process. Um, obviously, we weren't planning to uh, do any more amendments to our existing adopted 2040 uh, regional transportation plan. Um, however, based on some routine coordination with uh, the 470 Public Highway Authority, um, it did come to our attention that there was one project that they're working on, which is the widening of uh, the main lines of E470 from uh, Quincy to I-70, uh, taking that from its existing four lanes to six lanes. Um, that's a project that they're working on now um, that will that is in our existing 2040 plan, uh, but it is staged later in the 2040 plan, and the project's going to be done sooner um, than is reflected in our current 2040 plan. So, um, frankly, just to stay kosher with federal requirements in terms of how we're portraying projects in the plan, we do need to make sort of this technical amendment simply just to change the kind of staging period um, of this project the way it appears in the plan. Um, but we are following our typical sort of amendment uh, planning process in terms of uh, we're actually, um, as of yesterday, in a 30-day public comment period, uh, we will have a public hearing. Um, we are doing air quality conformity modeling on this. Uh, we'll bring those results to the board. Uh, so going through the standard process, but really wanted to just notify, of you, notify you of it um, and be transparent in terms of this one sort of technical change to the plan. Um, that's really all I have, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, Melinda, are, are there um, any virtual hands being raised uh, for questions for Jacob? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we'll give everyone just a moment, just in case they would like to raise their hand. Okay. Yeah, at this time, I am not seeing any hands raised. Uh, thank you, Melinda. All right. The next, uh, next item, item seven. Draft uh, 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan Scenario Outcome Results. Jacob, again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so now let's get back to 2050. Let me pull up the presentation here on my screen. 
Uh, can everyone hear me and see my screen? Uh, we can, Jake. Okay, great. Um, so, um, as we've been working on 2050, um, I think many of you know, we've been working on some kind of neat scenario analysis. Um, some of you have seen some of this, but we just wanted to give you some highlights of the scenario analysis work that we've been doing and show you some of those results. Um, in this um, in this agenda item, uh, there were uh, there was a table and a couple of handouts to kind of help digest and make sense of the results. Uh, we have a PowerPoint here that we're going to go through. We're sensitive to both um, uh, the time of this meeting um, and the amount of data, so we're going to present a lot of stuff pretty quickly um, to get through it. Um, but we're going to just give you some highlights, and we'll be happy to take questions. So just to kind of reminder of the framework of our overall schedule, uh, we're in kind of that second phase. We started out with a lot of uh, public engagement last summer and fall. Uh, we're now in the second phase two here where we're starting to talk about scenarios leading into a conversation about regional investment priorities. Um, as we go later this year, uh, we'll be getting into uh, development of the draft uh, 2050 plan document and then adoption early next year. Um, in the scenario analysis, the point here was really um, sort of an exploratory planning exercise to uh, to just, you know, kind of understand and, and explore the relationships between land use and urban form, our multimodal transportation system, um, and what are, you know, what are the outcomes on travel and mobility patterns. So our approach to this work, um, you know, we're really, you know, we like to say we're exploring what if alternative futures. So what if we tried this or what if we what if we tested that? What would happen? Right. Um, we're doing some relative comparisons between scenarios and a baseline. And I'll talk about the baseline in just a moment. Um, this is not a rigorous evaluation of scenarios. We're not choosing or judging scenarios. We're not saying a particular scenario is good or bad. Uh, we're not picking a scenario or a hybrid of a scenario. This really is a an exploratory planning exercise, as I said, um, but it does help set up a conversation about choices and trade-offs from individual scenarios. Um, not all scenarios perform equally, um, and you see that in some of the results that we'll get to in just a moment. So it does present um, some interesting data and some interesting sort of thought-provoking um, ideas about, you know, if we tried this thing and this, and this result happens, what does that mean for the region over time? Um, with this, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Alvin, who's going to uh, kind of walk you through uh, the land use and the transportation scenarios we tested um, and then some of the results of that work. Alvin? Thank you. So we had two land use scenarios and five transportation scenarios. Uh, those were compared against a 2050 base, and you'll see what that means for each of these in a couple slides. Um, in addition to comparing each of these against a base, we also ended up combining some land use scenarios with some of the select transportation scenarios if we thought there could be some complementary effects, effects on mobility in the region. Next. Behind all of these scenarios, regardless of whether it's a land use scenario, a transportation scenario, or one of the combinations, we're using the same demographic projections on all of them. So by 2050, we're expecting another 1 million people and another 800,000 jobs in the region. So this data was kept consistent across each, across each of the scenario runs. Next. When we get into the actual outcomes that you'll be seeing, we were looking at three main metrics, vehicle miles traveled, transit walk and bicycle trips, and vehicle hours of delay. We wanted to introduce them to you here so you can see where we are currently in 2020 and where we expect to be by 2050. Uh, by 2050, we do expect each of these to increase. Next. I'd mentioned we were comparing scenarios against a base. On our transportation side, what that means is we're taking our adopted and amended 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and looking at those fiscally constrained projects within it. So these are our new roads and our road widenings, so our roadway capacity projects and our rapid transit projects that are currently in the plan. So we're taking these 2040 projects and running them on a 2050 land use, so we can start talking about a 2050 base in terms of transportation. Next. I'd mentioned we were combining scenarios. So in addition to taking our 2050 base land use with our transportation scenarios, we also took our infill land use scenario and combined it with our travel choices scenario and our center scenario and took that with our transit scenario. And you'll get a refresh on what each of these means as we get into the actual outcomes of each of the slides. I'll pause here, Mr. Chair, if there are any questions on a quick introduction to the scenario planning. Thank you very much. Um, uh, at this time, committee members, if there are any questions so far, um, please raise your virtual hand and Melinda will call on you. And Melinda, I will. Oh. Um, 
Uh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, it looks like we do have a hand raised. It looks like uh, it is from Kate Williams. Kate, you can go ahead. Yep. Thank you very much, Kate Williams, RTD Director. Um, I know this is a horrible time to be a planner. I'm just wondering if these scenarios have been adjusted for the situation that we are in today. So, Director Williams, this is Jacob Rieger. Thanks for your question. Um, the short answer is no, they haven't been adjusted. Um, but we've all been doing a lot of thinking uh, about what the pandemic means for us going forward. Obviously, no one has any clear answers yet. Um, just a couple of quick things I'll say. One thing is that in a 30-year plan, and that's what we're looking at for a 2050 plan, uh, whenever we do this work, you know, with a 20 or 30-year time frame, we're already sort of always adjusting for uh, up and down economic cycles as kind of standard practice um, when you're doing this long-range planning work. So it's just extremely unfortunate that we're in one of those downturns right now at the beginning of it. Um, but, you know, we will eventually recover, and over the course of 30 years, um, you know, things will sort of cyclically go up and down. So we're trying to account for that on the one hand. On the other hand, um, you know, it remains to be seen. Uh, none of us have the answers in terms of things like working from home, teleworking, some of these other trends, you know, how, how much is society, how much is travel behavior going to change um, from what's happening right now? Um, but we're trying to be thoughtful about what are, what are potential implications for um, moving forward? My favorite example from this is teleworking or working from home. Um, you know, if if this leads to a larger share of teleworking over time, something that really sticks over the next 30 years, you know, is that something that uh, we should potentially be accounting for? So we're, we don't have the answers, but we are asking those questions. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Jacob. Great. Um, Melinda, is, are there anybody, uh, is there anybody else who has their hand raised this time? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our next question comes from John Stanton. John, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. Thank you. Um, really appreciate Jacob's team on a 2050 planning, but I think we ought to take COVID, as the previous speaker said, as our new world for the next few years, and it probably will change transportation patterns into the future. And would it be possible for Dr. Keg and R RTC to consider an alternative long-range plan based on what if passengers continue to avoid buses and rail transit in the new realities. And I know um, a lot of the scenario is based on the ability to get people off the road more into transit, but I think we should be very open-minded and use all new data. My second recommendation is that Dr. Cog aggressively seek data from other cities to see what they're doing on this so that you can plug it in to a scenario uh, so that we can maybe have a side-by-side -side, uh, presentation in the future because I, I think this is our new reality. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Linda, um, is there anybody else with additional questions or comments so far? At this time, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, please continue. Thank you. So we'll start out with our off-peak congestion scenario. That included widening I-25 uh, and I-270 and then rebuilding four interchanges. So that was a pretty significant investment and there's a less than 1% change in vehicle miles traveled and transit trips. But we do see a small decrease in regional delay. So someone driving from Lone Tree to Broomfield uh, compared to the 2050 base would have a sh slightly shorter commute. Next. For our managed lanes and operations scenario, we were looking at building out a regional tollway network as shown on the map. Um, this one did show a decrease in delay compared to the 2050 base, so about 25%. Uh, because of the increase in capacity, there is a slight increase in VMT. Next slide. Our travel choices scenario was looking at building out a regional bikeway and sidewalk network. We also slowed down traffic, uh, traffic speeds on some key arterials, and then we also uh, encouraged teleworking. So as a result of that, there's actually 400,000 fewer drive alone work trips every day compared to our 2050 base. That's driven primarily by teleworkers, as we've heard previously. Uh, not unexpectedly, we're seeing an increase in bicycle and pedestrian trips, but that does come at a slight cost of transit trips. Next slide. And then our final transportation scenario is our transit scenario uh, that finishes fast tracks, builds out a regional bus rapid transit network and makes transit free. Uh, as we expect, there are now more transit trips, there are now more households using transit, and there are now more households who have good access to transit through jobs. 
jobs through transit compared to our 2050 base. Um, despite all those increases, there's still only a slight decrease in vehicle miles traveled. So that indicates that transit trips are still a really small percentage of all trips that are taking place in the region. Next. So as part of our uh, analysis, we said the comparisons were really important for us. So we're gonna show you those three previous metrics again. Uh, I would note that our off-peak congestion scenario didn't perform significantly different from our 2050 base. So that's been combined into this far left gray bar you see here. With the remaining three transportation scenarios you see in green, uh, the most significant impact on VMT was our travel choices scenario, just because there are now less folk uh, driving as a result of teleworking or they've been shifted to biking and walking. Next. Not unexpectedly, our travel choices scenario and our transit scenario are the two that significantly increased our transit walk and bicycle trips. Uh, perhaps surprisingly, the one that had the most impact was our travel choices scenario compared to the level of investment we did for our transit scenario. So that's again driven primarily by that increase in teleworking and our ability to shift trips to biking and walking. And then our last metric is vehicle hours of delay. So across the remaining three transportation scenarios, you see compared to the 2050 base, we do have a decrease in delay. The most significant of that is in the managed lanes and operations, uh, just because you're getting people to use the regional tollway network. Uh, and then travel choices, you're just getting less folk driving on the roads and using biking and walking. I'll pause again, Mr. Chair, for any questions on the transportation scenario outcomes. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, committee members at this time, if you have any questions so far for this section of the presentation, please raise your hand. And Melinda, I will turn it to you to uh, facilitate um, if there's any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it looks like our first question comes from Paul Gisaitis. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just had a couple comments about the managed lanes aspect, and I haven't dug into the data deeply, so um, I want to start by just saying I appreciate what you guys are doing here. Um, if you've been out and about lately, you've noticed on the interstate highway system, as we've um, encountered a two-thirds reduction in traffic volumes, if you've gone out and about, um, you've also noticed a huge amount of freight on our highways. So any plan that is adopted needs to consider that you can't put freight on a transit um, scenario. So uh, very important just to understand the huge amount of freight that the CDOT um, state highway system um, plays in delivering goods to all of us. Um, my second comment is just related to the managed lanes master plan that CDOT has been developing. Um, you know, that's a really good comprehensive plan of how CDOT intends to provide travel time reliability. Um, so one of the great things about managed lanes is um, that is one of the few ways that um, understanding we cannot widen our way out of congestion, that we can provide a reliable trip for people trying to get somewhere where they need to go in a very rapid fashion. And in exchange for that, they pay for that service. Um, in addition, those managed lanes also um, encourage use of um, uh, carpools with uh, three plus. And um, as US 36 is an example, BRT is a significant component of the, of the US 36 corridor from Boulder to Denver, showing that um, managed lanes also um, enhance the, tra the travel of transit. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, lastly, I just like to also point out in terms of revenue, um, a corridor like the C470 project is paid for two-thirds um, or greater than two-thirds by the toll revenue from that corridor. And without that toll revenue, a project like that would not have probably occurred in the next 50 years. Anyway, thanks for the opportunity to comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Gisaitis. Um Melinda, do we have any additional questions or comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, at this time, it looks like we do not. Great. Thank you. Uh, please continue. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if Andy Taylor is on the line, um, we'll have him present the kind of land use scenarios that we looked at. Sure. Thank you. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, before we talk about how the land use scenarios we looked at are different from each other, let's just touch on what we held constant throughout all scenarios. As Alvin mentioned, we held household and job growth constant in each scenario. All scenarios are anchored to local plans and zoning based on the best available information. So really what that means is if one of the scenarios assumes an increase in capacity for jobs or housing, that increase is done relative to what's in place now. 
so what that boils down to is that an increase in capacity in Denver and Castle Rock could look very different, even if we um, make some assumptions about increasing them um, the same percentage. Uh, we're also assuming that scheduled development data uh, that we've been accumulating about approved plats um, is included in all scenarios in the same way. That results in about 200,000 units being assumed in all those scenarios. And that's really just taking note that there are a lot of approvals that are already in place. Uh, so these scenarios show that there is still a lot of room um, for, for differing performance, even with those uh, being assumed to be in place in the future. Uh, we made no changes to the predictive parts of the urban sim model either. It remains calibrated the same way throughout all the scenarios. Next slide. Uh, what we do do is introduce change by assuming uh, that uh, different location choices are available uh, for households and jobs. Uh, what that means is assuming more or less capacity for housing and jobs than what uh, current zoning or plans might have in place. Uh, both the infill and center scenarios are sourced directly from MetroVision and focus on different areas that are called out in MetroVision, as you'll see on the next slides. Uh, next slide. So our region is about the size of Connecticut spatially. Uh, however, according to this, the Census Bureau, just to give you some context, what they consider to be urban or really non-rural uh, is only about 15% of that space. So keep that in, in mind when you're looking at these numbers related to infill and centers. The infill scenario focuses on a subset of that urban area. It allows for some modest intensification over a broader area than the center scenario, which only targets about 3% of the region's spatial extent. Uh, the result of making these different choices available is that the infill area captures three-fourths of household growth to increase its share of total households. Um, uh, think of this like market share. The market is growing and the share itself is growing. Uh, the center's area is a much smaller geography. It captures less than a fifth of all households to start, but it captures nearly two thirds of the growth. And while that 37% uh, total share uh, by 2050 in that scenario might not seem large, it reflects a significant focusing of development activity. Next slide. Uh, so here it is on some maps. Uh, Household growth is happening throughout the region in all these scenarios. What this is showing is where some of the most intense activity would be occurring. Alone, each map might not reveal much insight about where growth is happening, but when all three are compared, uh, you may start to see some differences. Uh, however, maps alone may not tell this story well. Uh, some numbers that we have on the next slide may be better to show some of the differences between scenarios. Uh, comparing the scenarios shows that they are progressively more dense. Uh, these are metrics straight from MetroVision itself uh, and comparing our scenario performance against those 2040 uh, MetroVision targets. Uh, these scenarios are progressively more dense, more centers focus and offer more housing choices near job centers, are more focused away from single family areas uh, in development and are more uh, intense or, uh, or focused on specific areas of change. Uh, and so uh, with that, I think uh, the next slide may be a break for questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, committee members, if there are any additional questions on this section of the uh, presentation, please feel free to raise your hand at this time. Um, and Melinda, I will turn it to you to identify if there are any hands raised and questions needed to be asked. Thank you so much. Um, we'll give everyone just a moment to get those hands raised if they need to. Okay, um, and at this time, I am not seeing any hands raised. Great, thank you very much. Please continue. So the first uh, land use scenario we'll look at is our infill scenario. Remember that one's uh, allowing redevelopment and infill around 11% of the region's land area. Uh, this one also does not have any additional transportation investments, but we are seeing a decrease in VMT and a decrease uh, in delay on average. Um, there's also twice as many transit trips and an increase in bike walk trips. Next slide. When we combine our land use scenario with our travel choices transportation scenario, you see those are impacted even further. Uh, VMT decreases by 14.5 million each day compared to the 2050 base. 
there's also now twice as many walking and bike trips and there's more transit trips taken in this combination scenario than there were in the transit scenario by itself. Next slide. Similar to how we were showing these different comparisons between the transportation scenarios, we wanted to show you how this looks like as we step through the process for this. So um, moving from left to right in each of these graphs, you can see we started with our 2050 base um, and then we just ran our travel choices transportation scenario alone in green. And then the infill scenario you most recently just saw in orange then the combination in blue. So this, uh, we wanted to see how this process moved forward as we step through each of these combinations in the process. So you can see each of these are impacted greater as we move through this. Excellent. Our second land use scenario was centers. Again, that was focusing uh, development around rapid transit stations, urban centers, and key employment centers. Uh, again, there are no additional transportation investments in this land use scenario by itself, but there is a decrease in VMT and a pretty significant decrease in delay. We also have three times as many transit trips and over twice as many walk and bicycle trips. Next slide. We again combine that with the transportation scenario. So in this case, our transit scenario. Uh, again, these are impacted even more significantly. Uh, we have a decrease of 24% in VMT compared to our 2050 base, 50% less delay compared to our 2050 base and three times as many walk and bike trips and six times as many transit trips. Uh, that equates to about 2.4 million transit trips daily compared to our 2050 base. Next slide. So we did the same thing that you had just previously seen in this step through process to see how these two metrics were being impacted. Uh, we still have our 2050 base, our transit scenario in green, our center scenario in orange and our combination in light blue. Uh, on this graph, you are seeing a, an extra step that we took that was not shown in a previous slide is this dark blue bar on the far right where we started to take into account uh, the cost of a vehicle. Uh, that could be different fees that are being paid or uh, different um, the cost of like parking or registration fees in the region. So this was just an extra step that we took to see uh, what happens to these metrics as we add more, more to them. So we'll look at the three metrics that we had seen previously again to compare each other and compare to the 2050 base. In terms of VMT, you can see that both land use scenarios in orange and both combinations in blue decrease our VMT compared to our 2050 base. The most significant of these though are in our combination scenarios. So infill plus travel choices and centers plus transit. In terms of transit walk and bike trips across the board, we have significant increases compared to our 2050 base. Uh, the most significant though are in our centers and our centers plus transit scenario. And then across the board again, in terms of delay, we're seeing a decrease compared to our 2050 base, but the most significant is actually in our centers plus transit scenario. You can see we're showing a negative percentage there. So it's not just a decrease compared to our 2050 base, it's actually a decrease compared to our current 2020 levels. I'll pause again, Mr. Chair, for any questions they might have. Y'all may have. Thank you very much. Committee members, if you have any questions at this time, please raise your hands. Uh, Melinda, please let me know if there are any questions. Absolutely. Thank you. We'll give everyone just a moment. Okay. It looks like at this time we have no hands raised. Great. Thank you very much, Melinda. Uh, please continue. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have five slides left. If Robert Spots is on the line, I'll ask you to present this section. Sure. So we looked at the potential um, greenhouse gas emission results from these scenarios. Um, when we're looking at the blue line, or the, excuse me, the blue bar graph, that's the emissions that we would have if we followed the um, current CAFE 2025 standards that exist today. That does not assume a massive um, deployment of an electric vehicle fleet th throughout the vehicles driven in the region. Um, and as you can see, our MetroVision target, uh, 2040 MetroVision target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 60% per capita, is that orange line. With those CAFE standards, none of these scenarios get us to that target. Um, we would need to rely on some um, adoption of electric vehicles to help us reach that target. Um, the orange bar is if in each of those scenarios there was about a 25% adoption of electric vehicles, then you can see the centers in transit one gets us there. If there is mass adoption of electric vehicles, 
the green bar, you can see any scenario really gets us to our greenhouse gas emission targets. Um, it really points out to how critical and um, probably the most important aspect of reaching that target is going to be um, changing out uh, vehicles to electric vehicles. Next slide. We also wanted to touch uh, on automated and connected vehicles. It's um, you know it's a really difficult question, uh, much like what's going on with COVID. There's so much unknown with this technology. There's a broad range of outcomes. Some of them could be looked at as positive. Some may be more negative. Um, things like there might be more shared ride there, and um, people are carpooling, and um, you know. And then there's also potential where there's a lot of vehicles that have zero people in them and they are driving around looking for new passengers to pick up or someone's taking their vehicle to work and then sending it home without a passenger in it. Um, so we didn't want to draw any definitive conclusions, but we did want to, you know, discuss how we we, we did evaluate the the various potentials of fear of, of uh, the, <laughs> excuse me, the potentials of auto, automated and connected vehicles. There's a broad range of potential outcomes, and we didn't want to, you know, stand by a specific conclusion. Throughout this process, we've also been engaging our youth advisory panel and our civic advisory group. Uh, we've held two meetings so far this year. Uh, back in late February, early March, we did a March Madness activity with them. Uh, we asked them to fill out the brackets you see in the bottom left to start uh, prioritizing the relative importance of some of the outcome metrics we look at in our regional transportation plan. And then most recently in late April, early May, we had them complete a budget game uh, that was tied to our online engagement page that you see on the bottom right. Uh, we had them test out the page, test out the budget game to see if everything made sense. Um, they received a presentation, just similar you did on the outcomes of each of these scenarios. And then they were asked with a limited budget to fund some of these scenarios to see what investment priorities there were from each of those groups. Okay, thank you, Alvin. So this is our very last slide. Really just to summarize here, um, as you've seen, there's you know, a lot of very interesting and fascinating data and results from this work. Um, so over the past couple months, we've been engaged both with our Transportation Advisory Committee and with the public of just sort of digesting and processing these results. But we started a conversation with our uh, Transportation Advisory Committee in particular on what do we think this all means for how we step forward uh, to the next steps of preparing the 2015 uh, Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. More specifically, you know, how do the results of these scenarios, how does uh, the results of what we're hearing from the public and all the work that we've done so far, how does that inform um, articulating investment priorities, um, starting to think about projects for the fiscally constrained plan, starting to think about the financial plan. Uh, so those are conversations that we're, as I said, currently engaged in uh, with the public and the Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, we do anticipate bringing those conversations forward to you at a future meeting. Um, but at least wanted to start here today uh, with having you see all of all of this work and all of these results. As we get into uh, kind of summertime, uh, we'll be uh, focusing very specifically on identifying and evaluating projects um, to uh, develop the fiscally constrained 2015 uh, regional transportation plan, and along with that, preparing the financial plan and other pieces that will create eventually the 2050 Metro Vision regional transportation plan. Uh, so with that, we'd be happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, committee members, uh, if there are any questions at this time, please raise your hand. And Melinda, I will turn it to you for uh, any questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll give everyone just a brief moment to get hands raised if they have any questions or comments. Okay, it looks like at this time we have no additional questions or comments. Great, thank you, Melinda. Um, let's move on to the uh, next part of our agenda, informational items, item eight, federal planning certification review and request for comments. Uh, that's just a piece uh, that uh, committee members can review uh, at, their, at their own time. Uh, the administrative item part of the agenda, item nine, member comment or other, other matters. If there are any additional comments or other matters of the committee members, please feel free to raise your hand and Melinda will, um, will let us know. Melinda. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll give everyone just another brief moment. 
Okay, looks like we don't have any additional comments. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, item 10, next meeting is June 16th, 2020, and um, at 9.52 a.m., this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone.